So I think we can start. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so this is like probably my smallest crowd that I've done in a while, <laughs> which is a bit nerve wracking because normally you can't see who's who's in the back and you can just say things, but now you're all looking at me and I'm all looking at you. Uh, yeah, so who's actively using Kotlin in their apps? Apps or anything, web app, whatever, server side. <laughs> okay, who started learning it? Who wants? This week, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey to learning Kotlin. So it's been a bit of a, a rough journey for me. Uh, let's just make this full screen. That's not full screen. No. I don't know. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, so I started learning Kotlin, I'd say about sort of two years ago, but it, it didn't really go so well for me. So only recently have I really started looking at Kotlin. So I thought I would share how I failed at Kotlin and <laughs> uh, what I really don't, like what I thought is difficult to learn and what I think is nice about the language as well. So a lot of it's gonna be pretty introductory as well, but hopefully the people that have already done some Kotlin will learn something new. Otherwise, I'm sorry, but you got free pizza. <laughs> oh, so I didn't introduce myself. So for those that don't know, uh, my name is Rebecca Franks and you can find me on the internet at Rigaroo. Um, I'm an Android developer by day, so I use Kotlin for Android. Okay, so what is Kotlin? So Kotlin is a language developed by JetBrains, and I think it started in 2010, correct me if I'm wrong, but they've been around for quite a while. JetBrains makes all the cool products, so IntelliJ, Android Studio, Rider, what else, PHP Storm, basically all the, all the tools that you use. And they've come up with Kotlin. So Kotlin is a statically typed programming language, and it's got some really cool features. You can interrupt with many different platforms and languages, so it's, it's really nice to work with as well. So why should you learn Kotlin? Well, recently, quite recently, I got an email that says, hi, we're looking for a senior person that has Kotlin knowledge, preferably. Um, and I haven't seen this before, at least in Johannesburg. So this was interesting for me. I was like, oh wow, okay, people are recognizing that Kotlin is now a thing. Google has supported it. So this is actually very scary because most people that are developing for Android haven't really started looking at Kotlin yet, so at least locally. So I think this is a sign to say, you should start learning, at least know what this language is and, and how it works. Okay, so I'm talking a little bit about my journey to learn Kotlin. Um, so I saw a lot of hype around Kotlin. There was a lot of people blogging about it, especially within the Android community. There were countless blog posts and people talking about it, but I didn't really, I don't know. I, I watched a video on Kotlin and I was like, okay, this is cool. I'm, I'm not a big language person, let me just say that out, <laughs> out loud. I, I, I just use the language that's right for the job. So there's this, this video um, by Jake Watson called Android Development with Kotlin, and I think this was probably the one video where everyone sort of started going a bit um, crazy for Kotlin. So this is a very good video to watch with the benefits of Kotlin and, and how it works for Android. So I then decided the best way for me to learn is to write an article on it. So in 2015, I think it is 2016, uh, January 2016, I was like, all right, let's put a blog post up because that's how I teach myself how to learn. Um, how to set up your apps using Kotlin to write your tests on your Android app. And after that, I kind of just forgot about Kotlin. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool, Kotlin, whatever. And I carried on writing Java. Uh, I didn't really, like the people were still talking about it, but it wasn't really a big thing or anything like that. And then Google I.O. happened. And everyone was really excited. <laughs> It was Google I.O. 2017, I was in the audience there, and everyone was like, there is official Kotlin support now in Android. And I, the crowd was like, yeah, big cheers. And I was like, uh. <laughs> I was clapping, but in my mind I was slightly freaking out, because I knew, I knew that this meant I had to learn this language, and I couldn't ignore it for much longer. So I tried a couple things. I was like, okay, Google said it's official, I have to learn this language now. So I tried looking at the Kotlin cones. So 
I was chatting with Rory a little bit about this earlier, and these are a really good way to learn different language features. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, but it just didn't really work for me. So you can go online and try them out, all the different features on Kotlin, uh, try.kotlinlang.org, and you can test all the different features, and it sort of slowly teaches you all of the, the different features. I uh, then decided to try an online course because I couldn't really do the cones. I got a bit bored. I, I don't know. I just tried to do an online course. So I started one on Udemy called Kotlin for Beginners. And I got pretty far, 40% uh, 40, 40 of the way. <laughs> but then, like, it just wasn't, I don't know, it just wasn't, really wasn't working for me. So I bought the Kotlin book. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I bought this book called Kotlin for Android Developers, and I read this whole book. Actually, I got through the whole thing, so I was quite proud of myself. And this one sort of like introduced some cool Kotlin ideas, but it didn't really, I don't know, it didn't really cement my knowledge in, in Kotlin. So I bought another Kotlin book, because I, I wasn't quite done yet. <laughs> uh, I bought the Kotlin in Action book, and this one is a really, really good book, and I feel like this is what's really helped me the most in terms of learning all the different language features. It's written by... Uh, two of the people from JetBrains that actually work on Kotlin. So it's really, really extensive and it's a really nice read as well. I haven't finished it though yet, so. <laughs> okay, and then I decided to command alt shift k a few files. So if anyone knows that shortcut, basically you have some Java code and you run the shortcut and it's magically Kotlin. So you're writing Kotlin effectively, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what you can say. Uh, basically, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just like trying to learn this language, and it really, really, it was really hard for me. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. <laughs> so then I just decided, okay, let me just write it. Like I, I can't back away from this anymore. I can't just keep writing Java. So I just decided my next app that I'm writing is all going to be in Kotlin, and this is how I'm going to learn. And I think that was actually probably the best move for me to make because when I started writing it, it became a lot easier for me to understand and started learning more and more features as I was writing it. So I released an open source app um, as part of DVT's uh, account online. And this is a showcase Android app. I don't know if I probably look at that code now. It was a few months ago. It's probably not what I would write today. But it was sort of where I learned most of the features of Kotlin. Well, not all the features of Kotlin, but a lot of them. So this app is available. It's basically just so you can view a list of apps that DVT has built. You need a login though. So, so I think the, the most important thing that I realized when I was doing this whole thing and like my, my fear of the language was that I, I, at first I thought I needed to know all the features in order to write code. And I think that was why I didn't want to write the code because I thought I don't know how to do everything in Kotlin so I'm not going to try write it. And I think that's a really bad way to look at it because you will never know everything there is to know about the language. There's always a better way to do something in it. So I think the best way to do it is to just start writing. As soon as you know a little bit about it, just start writing and you'll slowly learn and pick up new features as you go. Okay, so covered a little bit about how I got to where I am. So we're gonna talk a little bit about different, the different features of Kotlin. So the most basic uh, thing in Kotlin is that there's no semicolons, yay. <laughs> Unless you want them. I mean, you can have them, but you don't need them. And the compiler will probably tell you that they're unneeded, so you don't need them. I think this is probably one big concept that I found people didn't really know, uh, is the var and val concept. So a var is basically a variable value. So you don't have like how you define in Java, you uh, specify the type. You can just say var instead of the type. And a val is basically your constant value, so you don't need to specify a type when you're doing this kind of thing. So a quick example, uh, over here you can see we have the first line says var temperature and we're giving it a type after that and we assign the value of one. So this is just an integer with a value of one, but we can also quite easily leave out the type and it will automatically infer it. And this example is now a constant value, so it won't be able to be changed. So if we look at this, the next line, I create a val, uh, give it a value, and then I try to change that value, and this is where a compilation issue would obviously occur, because now this is not a variable value. But if you have, obviously, a var instead of a val, you can change the value. Okay, so another big concept in uh, Kotlin that's not really 
a thing in Java <laughs> is the concept of nullability. So this is, means you can have a variable that has a null value as well as one that can never have a null value. So the Kotlin type system distinguishes between references that can hold null and those that cannot. So this allows you to avoid the null pointer exception. And I think this is, like a lot of people say, you don't have null pointer exceptions when you write Kotlin, which is not entirely true. So you do have null pointer exceptions. You just, you can sort of avoid them if you do the right, the right kind of code, but it's not, uh, you won't completely get rid of null pointer exceptions. Um, sorry? They shouldn't surprise you. That shouldn't surprise you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, you can't immediately say, oh, I don't have null pointer exceptions anymore. You'll get other exceptions. You get like, your property's not initialized, or it's just like deferred, or you can still get nulls if you want them as well. Okay, so let's look a little bit at a quick example of this. So this first one, we're saying uh, var average is a double type, and we're assigning the value of zero, of one. And then I change the value to two, and then I try to change the value to null. So if I had to do a similar thing in uh, Java, this would work because you don't have to, you can assign a null value to a double, right? You can store null in your double value. So in Kotlin, that doesn't compile. Sorry, that doesn't compile in Kotlin. So this will say, sorry, you can't assign null to this value because it's not a nullable type. So now if you do want a nullable type, you would need to add that question mark at the end of your variable. And I think this is the same in a lot of different languages. C sharp, maybe, I'm not sure. But basically now you're saying that this variable can store a null value as well. So now I can assign null and there's no problems. Yep. It's very similar. <laughs> so the, the yeah. The one was open source, the other one was a yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you look at the language, yeah. if you look at the language together, they look, read very similar. Like Swift and, and Kotlin, if you can read, uh, write Kotlin, you can probably very well read Swift. It's, it's actually really nice because now you can do iOS and Android without too much problem. Okay, cool. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about null point exceptions now. So we said you can avoid them, but you can also have them if you want. So in this first example here, I will get a null pointer exception. So the name variable that I have here is a nullable type. And if I use the what they call the double bang, I think it's the terminology, <laughs> um, this basically says, I don't care if this, like just execute this method on this uh, variable and it'll crash basically if this thing's null because it doesn't do any checks for you. Then we look at what we call a safe call. So this is where um, question mark, question mark period, question mark, I don't know. <laughs> so basically this, this will do a null check for you. So this will say, okay, if Bob is not null, go and check the department. If the department's not null, check the head. If the head's not null, check the name and return the name. Okay, and if any one of those are null at some point, that name value that we have will have a null value. So you might want to do um, the next thing, which is what they call the Elvis operator, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, so the Elvis operator, you can see it's like his hair and the two eyes. If you look at it slanted. <laughs> it's a safe call with a donor. Yeah, so basically now what this will do is it'll say, okay, if this first uh, expression is null, uh, return minus one, otherwise return this expression. So now your your length variable will never have a null value. Cool. So this is a common example that people do a lot of the time. So um, I've created a string here called that has the value of hello, but it's also a nullable type. And now you get all these different methods in Kotlin, the let, with, run, apply, there's a whole bunch of them. And basically now this name uh, question mark, period, let, is now saying in this block that we have, this text will now not be null at this point. So within this block, we've already done this. Basically, it's a null check. It's the same thing. I guess you can think of it like that. And we can assign a value here. So I think the problem is, I see a lot of people doing this, but the problem is now you don't get like an else case. So you can still do the same uh, if 
something is null and else case, you can still do that in Kotlin. You don't have to do a let. It's just a, a way of doing it if you want to. Um, yeah, but there's a whole bunch more operators that you can do that do similar sort of things. There's a, a really good talk online about the differences between with, run, let, and all that. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail around that. Cool. So one of my favorite ones is the, the late init property. So I know uh, PJ in the audience doesn't, doesn't really like these, but I really like them. Basically, uh, I've got an example here. So this is an activity in Android. So it could be anything. It could be a test that you write or anything like that. And I've got a variable defined as a late init variable. So this is basically saying I'm not going to initialize this variable in a constructor, but I'm going to initialize it at a later point in time. Okay, so in Android, it would typically be in something like your onCreate method, which is a, a life cycle method that happens after you've created the actual instance of the class. So now in my onCreate, I have this recycle view adapter that I can then assign, and now it is initialized at that point. So the interesting thing is if you try access this variable, this recycle view adapter variable before it's been initialized, you're basically getting a null pointer. It's just called something else now. I think it's variable not initialized or something like that. But yeah, so it's kind of like a nullable type, I guess, in that way. But not really. <laughs> you get a different exception. Does the, does the code compile if you forget to assign? Yes. That's why. So that's why it's yeah. quite because it's changing. Yeah. OK. Another one is lazy. So this one uh, is also pretty cool. It's a bit different to late in it. So lazy. Uh, is basically a keyword, or I think they call it a delegate. I'm not too sure with terminology. But basically here it's saying, uh, have this value, and this is a, a lazy initialized value. So only when this variable is called will it be initialized. And after that point, it'll just return that value that was used as the initialized, as the initialized value. So if you look at this example, I've got a, just a main function, like a Java main function. And I'm calling a print line with this lazy value and calling it again immediately afterwards. And you'll see the output from this is that the first time it runs, it runs this uh, computed string, so it outputs that, and then it outputs the hello. But then the second time it runs, it only outputs hello, because it's cached that value in that variable. Well, not cached, but assigned that value to that variable at that point. So it's pretty useful. Uh, I've seen some people do it in Android for things such as assigning views as well. So they do like a find view by ID inside the the delegate here, so they only have to get it once and then it's returned. But I've also seen some people uh, saying that it's not so good for fragments because when you rotate your screen, it sometimes stores the old version of that variable and doesn't reinitialize. So I don't know. I haven't really played around too much with it, with views at least. Cool. So when I, I really like the when keyword and the when thing, it's basically a switch case statement that you see in <laughs> in Java. But when allows you to do a little bit more than a switch case in, in Java. So in this example, this is a basic one. We have, we're just checking when a value is one or two. We're just printing out those values. And then the else is just printing out something else. But this is a cool example. So I have created an enum class for a currency. And I have a GBP or Great British Pound and the czar, so the South African Rand. And now I can do a win on those currency uh, object or currency enums, I guess is what you call it. And now if I say, okay, for currency GBP, do something, and for currency czar, do, some, do something else, okay? So the really cool part about this is that if you start to add new things into your currency enum, your code won't compile if you're not handling that case. So now at this point, I didn't change my win, but I added a new currency. And now I get the when expression must be exhaustive, exhaustive, add the necessary USD branch or else branch instead. So it's, it's really nice because then you don't forget about places where you've used this, this enum. So you can add an else case and then it'll always, it won't do that error for you. Or you can just do the USD branch if you wanted to. Okay, functions. Most exciting. <laughs> So functions are, are first-class citizens in, in Kotlin. And when I said this to a couple of people that I was training on Kotlin the other day, they were like, well, I don't understand what you mean. But basically, you can store a function in a variable and call that and pass that function around to other functions. It's really um, a nice way to 
to achieve a lot of things. So let's just look at a basic example of a function, what it looks like in Kotlin. So this function is just, uh, we define a function with the word, keyword fun, and we have, uh, we call it something, so we're calling it a calculate sum. And the difference between this and Java is that you have your, um, your type after your name of your variable for your parameters. And then your return type is at the end, so a little bit different there. And yeah, in this case, I'm just saying return a plus b to calculate the sum. But if you have a one-line function in Kotlin, you can just do um, a one-line and you can remove the return keyword as well as the return type and your parentheses. Okay, extension functions. So this one I really, I really like doing extension functions, especially for Android views, because you don't have all the functions that you really want on the views and it's nice to have them as part of the class because that's what an extension function is. It's basically adding a method onto a class that doesn't exist in the class definition itself. So if you have classes that are part of a framework or something like that, and you really want to add methods onto it that they don't exist and you don't have access to that source code or to the ability to change it, you can create an extension function and add whatever functionality you want on top of that class. So in this example, this first, this first line here, um, we're saying fun for function and then string dot hello. So this uh, string dot hello part is what actually defines that it's an extension uh, function. So here I am now defining the method hello on the type of string. So in this method I'm just returning the word hello plus the string that the user is using on this uh, for this function. Okay, so now to actually use that method I can just say, pass in any string and say dot hello. Now I've got this really random method on, on the string class, but I can use this anywhere in my code. And then it obviously just prints out hello Kotlin. Cool. So the next example is, so on the Android text views, I really got frustrated the other day, actually it was on the edit text. This should be an edit text, not a text view. But basically I wanted to get a, a float value out of what a user had typed in in an edit text field. But there's no function on the Android edit text field that gives you that. So I could create an extension function that gives me that. So I created one called get float value. And then inside here, I could cast the string that was there into the correct um, format of it, or I could throw an exception if it wasn't in the right way. Um, but this is just obviously a, a dumbed down version of this extension function. And now anywhere where I need to use it or I want to get this value from the user on the screen, I can just say uh, on this text view or edit text, uh, get the float value and it will run this extension function on it. Cool, default values. Okay, so looking back at that first example where we did the calculate sum method. So this, in this example now, I've added what we call a default value. So I've just said int equals two. So if you don't provide a value for a, now you will just have the value of two being used by default. So pretty self-explanatory as to what it does. But now if I want to use it, so in this case I'm saying uh, calculate sum with the value of three for b, I will then get the value of five out because it uses two by default. Yeah. So normally for default uh, values, it would be the last parameter passed to a function and then it can be omitted. And if you keep the order, then, you know, yeah. then the values will be there. But um, in the one you're showing here, you have to specifically say B equal three. You don't have as to. As opposed to just saying three. You can just say three as well. I just so, did it there for more explicit, like, so, so it's a bit more explicit. So it knows even though it's not in Yes. Word. So it'll generate, basically, if you look at like the Java equivalent, it basically generates two functions and um, the one just has one parameter and the other one has two. So it will know that the second one doesn't have a default. So um, it'll use that one if I didn't provide the B. Okay. But I, I like to do this because then you know it's like a bit more explicit, especially if you have a function with a lot of variables in it. And this interestingly can also be done on constructors. So you can provide default values on constructors, not just functions. Okay, so higher order functions and lambdas. So this is an example of a built-in method in uh, Kotlin called array list of, and that just basically creates an array list 
of integers at this point. So we've got uh, 3, 324, and that's going to create just a, a list of these numbers for me. And then there's a lot of built-in functions in Kotlin, and this is where uh, there's a whole, like the standard library has a whole array of things that you can use and, and um, without having to do all of this work yourself. So this first example, I'm, I'm saying array list, uh, example array dot filter, and I'm passing in a function into this. So this, this method takes in a function as a parameter. And I'm saying filter out uh, all the, ver the values that don't mod by two, um, that don't have a remainder or that have a remainder. And now you'll see the array that it prints out, it's filtered out all the values that don't satisfy this condition or that do satisfy them. I can never remember the, the two. But basically you can run all these cool functions on arrays or string, string arrays or anything like that. Uh, there's another one called map, which is pretty popular. So uh, the map function will just take every single item in this array and run this function for each item. So I just want to talk a little bit about this it keyword because I think that's a bit new as well. So the it keyword is basically the uh, the variable that's with, defined within that context of this function. I don't know if I'd explain that very well, but uh, each item now that when you iterate through this array, uh, one will be passed in and one will be the value of it at that point. So it'll run that function for every single value in this array, and then it will run the filter function for every single value in that array once it's done the map. So now you'll see that the result of this is just uh, 6, 12, and 18. But there's a whole bunch of these different functions built in, and you can then provide your own function into it. Cool. Okay, so this is an example of a, a function that takes in another function as a parameter. So this is uh, what we're talking about when we say higher order functions, is that you provide a function, a, another one inside it. So this is a, the, the definition of it. So in here we've got the name of the variable, and then this is the, the type, which is actually a function itself. So the type is that it takes in a double and returns nothing, but void, should I say? <laughs> so units is basically uh, Kotlin's equivalent of void, if you think of it like that. We will go a little bit more into that um, later, but think of it like a void in Java. So now I'm taking in this function, and now I can say, okay, do a certain calculation. So take the value that's been provided in and divide it by 100. And then I can call this function that's been passed in with this variable, with this value that I've just calculated. And that'll then invoke the function that the person has provided in and, and do whatever they wanted it to do for, you don't need to know what that, what that function does. So an example usage of this is I've got, I'm just calling this wherever in my activity or something like that. I'm calling calculate percentage with a value of two. And I'm providing in my function, my incomplete function, that'll run when this, uh, when this is called here in incomplete. So when you run this, it'll actually output uh, calculation completes uh, 0.02. So another interesting thing to note in Kotlin is if you have uh, a, a function as the last parameter in your definition of, of, of parameters in your function, you can uh, move it out. I think by moving it out, I mean you move it outside of the definition here and you just provide these uh, curly braces on the outside. And then this will be your last variable that's passed in. So it looks a bit different, but you could quite easily just put this inside and do a comma with that function inside there. Okay. So this is uh, another interesting one. So this is a, a higher order function with generics. So I'm saying I'm creating a function called execute work. I don't know what type of work will be returned from this function. So I can define it to work with any kind of class that's provided to me. So I can just define it here with a T and then use it here and then return it there as well. So in this case, I'm just saying log that it starts, log that it finishes, but you could do anything if you really wanted to. And I'm just running the job that's passed in and I'm then just returning that result to whoever's using it. So now to use that, I call it, I say, okay, execute this certain work and I'm passing in my function that I want to execute. So my function is now Five, uh, 100 times by five, and then I just log out that result. And the same thing for the string calculation, so I'm passing in now a different function, so I'm passing in a function that takes strings and adds them together, and then I'm outputting that value. And you'll see the, the output that you'll see here is that it's running those logs, so it'll say work started, work finished, 
results, work started with finished string results with the uh, Rebecca hello string. Cool, classes in Kotlin, crash course in Kotlin. Okay, so in Kotlin, classes I think are a lot more concise. You don't have as much code to write a class. So this example, I've got a class called admin, and if you're doing, uh, so this is extending or um, or implementing a user interface, uh, the, the semicolon, or colon, not semicolon, the colon here is used for either. So implementation of an interface or extending of a, another class. And then I've just got some variables defined, and then a constructor, this is pretty simple to, uh, similar, except it has the word constructor now. And then I've got another function, so is adult, and that just returns if the person is older than 18. But you can make this a lot more concise. So we can define the variables or the uh, constants in this case at the constructor level here. So we don't have to define them in the previous one where we saw them defined here and create a constructor. If you do it like this, it'll automatically create these uh, properties inside your class for you, and it'll do the assignment and everything for you. So you don't need to do all of that that we were doing. And we can make it even shorter by just returning and removing the return without the parameters. So we've gone down from a lot of lines to, to three lines with some space. <laughs> Okay, so there's another thing in Kotlin called data classes. So data classes are very um, very popular for things such as like responses from networks or something like that because they automatically generate a whole bunch of uh, code for you. So your two string uh, is automatically generated, your hash code function and your equals function is automatically generated for you. And you don't need to do anything for that to happen. So you just define your variables that you want and you, uh, you use the keyword data and all of that stuff is done for you. You can also add custom methods onto this as well if you wanted to, like we did in the previous class as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the fun things in Kotlin. So there's a thing in Kotlin called coroutines. Anyone worked with coroutines before? <laughs> Two people, okay. Hopefully I'll teach someone something new then. <laughs> okay, so coroutines, uh, I just wanna put a big big star there, they're experimental. So they haven't been officially like released, I guess, but they're, they're publicly available and you can use them. They're just not guaranteeing <laughs> production worthiness, I guess. But coroutines allow you to simplify your asynchronous programming. And it's basically just a very lightweight thread. And the example that I've seen online is that you can spin up one million coroutines like on an Android device very easily. And that's very impressive because if you try to do that with threads, you just forget about it. You won't be able to do that. So I think coroutines are really going to uh, change the way we do at least Android development in that we'll be able to write uh, really nice looking code as well as uh, really lightweight um, threads that we'll be using. Okay. So coroutines are computations that can be suspended without blocking a thread. So they've got some fancy maths that they're doing and algorithms that allow it to schedule things properly, but there's a lot a lot of information online about coroutines. I found that tutorial at the bottom, and I'll, I'll share the slides at the end, but the tutorial linked at the bottom is uh, one of the most comprehensive, and it shows you exactly what coroutines are and how to use them. But let's have a quick look at a coroutine um, in Kotlin. So this is an example of using a coroutine to launch something and run something on the background thread. So in Android, this is especially popular because you cannot lock up a person's phone, otherwise the app will just get killed after a certain amount of time. So uh, you often have to defer things onto a background asynchronous thread, and a lot of people, at least the default way that people are doing it is with uh, asynchronous tasks. And if anyone's had to write one of those, they'll probably agree with me that they're really clunky and hard to hard to test and hard to uh, maintain. So this example, basically to use a coroutine, we're just saying launch. So this is one of the keywords from a coroutine. And you pass in the, the coroutine context, they call it. And this is where it'll be run on. So this background variable that I've created is basically got all uh, the, like the thread pool, you can think of it like that. And it knows, okay, these uh, threads that I've got are, you can run things on the background on these ones. So basically now in this launch method, I've got, I'm calling a method called request data. 
and I've got the result here. And then uh, in Android specifically, you need to then take that result and display it on a UI thread, okay? So now we would do another coroutine, and this says launch on the UI thread, and this is a, um, a thread that comes part of the, the packages and libraries of Kotlin coroutines. And now I can say, okay, take this text view and set it to the result from that request data method. So your request data method could be some kind of networking, it could be some kind of I.O. operation on a database, it can be anything that you want. Um, an example of what I've done is I've just uh, created what they call a suspend function. So this is what you actually have to do in order for a coroutine to work. So the suspend keyword, um, it'll make sure Kotlin knows exactly that it's a function that can run on a, a coroutine context, I guess. And um, you need to use this other keyword called delay instead of, you probably used to thread.sleep. So you shouldn't do that in a, in a coroutine because that'll uh, sleep the whole thread and you don't want that. You want to just sleep maybe that coroutine that you're using. So in this example, my suspend function is just delaying itself by three seconds. Why not? And it's returning the value of done. And now um, when this is called, it'll wait, it'll, sus it'll suspend that coroutine context, but then um, once it's finished, it'll, or it'll assign it to other uh, coroutines that need to run. But once that's done, we'll get that result done um, in here, and we can set that to anything on the UI thread. So they're very interesting. And the last thing that you need to remember with a, a coroutine, and probably anything in Android that's background asynchronous, is that you probably at some point need to cancel it if it hasn't finished running. So you probably want to add a on destroy into your on destroy method to cancel this coroutine. Cool. Coroutines are fun. Yeah, so there's a whole uh, very good link on more about coroutines. There's a really good talk as well online about it. Okay, Android KTX. Anyone an Android developer here? <laughs> Two people, okay. And I know both of them. extension library that just announced Yeah. So the Google team announced um, what they call the Android KTX, so the Android Kotlin Extensions Library. And that's just basically created an open source repository that takes all the Android APIs and makes them nicer to work with. So I'll show you a few examples, but lucky for you, I won't go into too much detail. But it's basically yeah, a set of extensions, Kotlin extensions for Android. And here's an example of it. So before, if you wanted to store something, uh, so shared preferences in Android is basically just like user settings. So to do that before, you would have to call uh, edit, um, put a Boolean with a value, and then you'd have to call apply. So now with Kotlin extensions or uh, Android uh, Kotlin extensions, you can just call shared preferences.edit and it'll do all that other stuff for you. Another cool example is um, drawing on uh, or observing a view tree ob uh, a view tree listener, basically. So this in Android is basically saying, when this view on your screen is uh, being laid out, um, add a pre-draw listener, so it listens before it's drawn, and then do something and unsubscribe it, so remove this pre-draw listener, and then trigger your action that you want to do, and then um, add this listener again, or something like that. So now with Kotlin, uh, Android Kotlin extensions, all you need to do is say, uh, view dot do on pre draw, and you can call the act action to be triggered, and it will do all this other stuff for you. So it'll automatically remove it, and then add it again. So there's some real good gems in this in this library. Uh, I think my favorite from it is this this top one. So in Kotlin, you can do I think what they call destructuring. Is that the word for this? Yeah. So destructuring allows you to take and uh, get assign all these variables. Um, values. And this example here, we're doing a color.magenta, and this is a built-in thing on Android, so if you say color.magenta, it'll give you the color for magenta. Uh, but now what it does with this line is it'll give me all the separate channels in that color, so I can get the RGB value without having to do any complex stuff. So it's pretty cool. Um, another one which is uh, surprisingly difficult to do in Android is to convert a drawable to a bitmap. So if anyone's had to do that, it takes like quite a lot of code. So now you can just say uh, .2 bitmap and you have a bitmap. Uh, but the Canvas extensions are also really, really good. So they've added a whole bunch of stuff to draw uh, like graphics on a screen. So if you're drawing paths or lines or squares or something, you can use uh, canvas.width 
translation and there's a whole bunch like draw and whatever. But to do this kind of thing before was a lot more code. So it's basically just slimming down your code a lot. And another cool one, uh, local date dot now, you can just destructure it into year, month, and day. I thought that was also pretty cool. Sorry? Even PHP does that. <laughs> well, you've got to get inspiration from other places, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the parts that I battled with with Kotlin. So people are like, no, that's the easy part, and I want to just emphasize, this is the difficult stuff I found for me, so it might not be difficult for you. The first thing I found really difficult was mocking. So uh, in Kotlin, when you create classes, they're final by default. So if you use something like Mockito, it relies on the fact that your classes are not final. So there's a lot of blog posts online to, to do workarounds and stuff, but it's still, like, it's not a really easy task to do. So you, you will get stuck and you'll Google for a while and then eventually you'll get it right and you're like, okay, cool, that's solved now. But it's still, like, every new project that I do, I have to go and Google and find these two blog posts <laughs> and then figure out what to do and do it again. But, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming this will get better in different library supports and stuff. So I don't assume this one to stay around for very long. Spring, they, um, there's a set of annotations that open them by, by default because they're going to need to be mocked or extended. Okay. Yeah, I suspect the same thing will happen. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about tooling as well. So IntelliJ is also good. Like, it's a really great IDE. If you've used any other ones, you'll probably agree with me. It's, it's one of the best. Um, but it doesn't write all your code, obviously. So unfortunately, it doesn't, doesn't, think what, it doesn't know what you're thinking. So at first, when I started with uh, Kotlin, it was difficult for me with the Lambda syntax. So I was really used to writing, I think, Java 6 without any Lambdas or anything really nice. So, I like getting used to writing lambdas and all that, it didn't auto-predict a lot of that for me. So, I, it was really a difficult thing. I had to, like, uh, this is the solution I had. So, I would write the code in Java <laughs> and then copy-paste the, the, the Java in, into the Kotlin file and then it'll auto-convert it and then it will suggest fixes and then you have really nice, beautiful written Kotlin code. So, I did this, I had to do this quite a, quite a few times just to get the hang of, like, what a lambda looks like and how it works. Um, but this was how I came around that, that problem. Uh, another different thing for me that was a little bit tricky to understand is there's, in Kotlin, there's a few different types that are very similar to the void type in, in Java. So there's the type of nothing, units, and any. And all of these can also be nullable as well. <laughs> so you can have a nothing that's got a question mark at the end and all the, a unit that's got a question mark as well. So this is still, I think, something that I, I'm not fully comfortable with, but um, I'm still writing Kotlin code, so it doesn't really matter, I guess. Uh, so the first thing, nothing, is basically something that never returns. So you can have a function that returns nothing as the keyword, and that'll never, ever return. So if you had some like, kind of looper or something that runs inf indefinitely, then you would use nothing. Or if you have something that's some kind of exception throwing, then you would use nothing. Uh, the other thing is a unit. So this one, like I mentioned, it's, it's very similar to void. Um, you can sort of allude it directly to void in, in Java, uh, but that's the default return type for a function that has no return type. Um, the next one is any. So this is uh, the default super type. So Java, it's similar to, this to Java's object type, but there are some like intricacies and some differences between them. So there's a, a good article that I've linked at the bottom with, it goes into really in depth, like the nullable parts of everything and all the different types. So I uh, highly suggest reading that if you get stuck at this point. But yeah, I think this was a bit of a weird thing for me coming from a Java background, dealing with all these different things that sort of mean the same thing, but not really. Yeah, but that article at the bottom is, is really good. Yeah, so some concerns. Obviously, with any new language, you have some like reasons why you're not using it. So uh, the first one a lot of people moan about is that you might be packaging another library within your app. So if you have an Android app that people are downloading, they have to download the Kotlin stuff with the app. Um, it's not a big deal, really, because it's only like uh, nine kilobytes when pro-guarded. So <laughs> it's, not, it's negligible, I guess. But a lot of people have this barrier that they don't, they don't want to do that. Another thing is that it's a big barrier for new developers. So we find a lot of people have Java experience, but you ask about Kotlin, and no, nobody's got that yet, right? So if you really want to get stuff going, and you, you probably don't want to 
start putting them on Kotlin if they're not comfortable with it. Uh, another concern is that Java 8 works with Android, like big uh, star, because not really. <laughs> so not all the features in Java 8 work with Android. So the Stream API, which is probably the nicest part about Java 8, is not available for you to use on Android. So that's why you would probably choose something like Kotlin, because it has all of that built in. And another one is that certain Java plugins are not supported. So Sona Cube. <laughs> Sona Cube is uh, there's an outstanding issue still. I know that one, that's one plugin that I know of, but I know there's a, a few that are still not really um, fully supporting Kotlin yet. I think it's just a lot of, uh, it'll just be a bit of time before a lot of them are supported. Sorry? <laughs> PJ solves Sona Cube. So if you have any. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I think this is this is true for any new language that has uh, tools that haven't been used with it. It's going to have maybe some teething issues. So I don't suspect this one to be a very prolonged issue. I mean, all of these concerns of mine is not really something long term. Maybe the barrier to entry is probably the one that will block you the most. But overall, I think uh, Kotlin is probably the better choice, at least for Android development. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit about resources that you can use to learn Kotlin yourself. So online, there's uh, the O'Reilly Introduction to Kotlin course that's done by Hadi Hariri. Um, it's pretty good as well. Then also you can just do a YouTube search for Kotlin on Android. There was a whole Kotlin conference recently, and there's a lot of content on there describing like anything you can imagine on Kotlin. So I suggest watching that. And then to practice, so you can do the Kotlin cones. Uh, the Kotlin repo is pretty cool as well. I'll show you that now. And there's a Kotlin Android code lab if you're more Android inclined, but I see nobody really is. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the Kotlin cones. We've seen the screenshot of that. Um, so the Kotlin repo is basically a way in which like a playground for executing Kotlin code. Um, I think this is pretty popular in most languages. Read, evaluate, print, loop. Did I get that right? <laughs> so this allows you to just execute different Kotlin code um, without needing to compile anything or run anything. So I can just do it straight in this little terminal kind of thing and run any Kotlin code that you want. So it's pretty cool. Uh, so I did mention these books earlier, but I would recommend the Kotlin Action book. Um, Kotlin for Android developers is cool as well, but I would first go with the Kotlin in Action, Kotlin in Action book. Yeah, and there's a massive online community already. So there's a Kotlin weekly newsletter that's pretty cool to subscribe to. You get all the latest news on Kotlin. There's a Talking Kotlin podcast. You can listen to them talk about Kotlin. And there's obviously Reddit for those that like Reddit. And I think my overall advice to everyone is to just start writing Kotlin code. So you're not going to know, <laughs> you're not going to know off the bat how to do everything. And I think as long as you accept that and you're just like, I'm gonna just start writing code, you'll you'll get a lot further than if you try to learn everything first before writing it. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions.